the need to create key principles of diversity and inclusion in different areas of museum practice and foster a culture of inclusive leadership. The discussions today will focus on how we can engage in authentic, respectful relationships with different communities. We'll explore the concept of shared authority and how to work collaboratively with communities to genuinely develop inclusive programming. In addition, we will reflect on how museums and cultural institutions are exercising intentionality to identify how they can create a more welcoming and inclusive space for Ontario's diverse communities. So thank you so much for joining us and setting aside this time to consider how we can work collectively to become a more diverse and inclusive sector that is stronger, more relevant, and more reflective and welcoming of all of Ontario's communities. Is there? Hello? Hello? I'm sorry, I just didn't hear anything and thought I'd cut off. Yep. Now you'll see a slide that's up that are showing our speakers that are coming up. And to guide our conversation as we consider the power of cultural institutions to impact communities and engage authentically with diversity, equity, and inclusion, we're very fortunate to have these three presenters with us today. Don Gappi, sorry, Gabach. Gabach, yeah. Yes, yeah, sorry. <laughs> is the president and chair of the executive board at the Toronto Ward Museum and is a professor of history at the University of Toronto Scarborough. Is well known around the world as a scholar of international migration, gender and food studies, and for interdisciplinary and digital history collaborations with scholars, librarians, and students. Thank you. I'm sorry for wrecking your last name. Second speaker is Jade Pachette. She's the Volunteer and Community Engagement Coordinator for the Canadian Lesbian and Gay Archives. Jade is an anti-oppressive educator who has worked the experience of experts and innovators. So oh, I think I that's correct. Many of these project participants are no, I think I've missed that. Sorry. That's okay. Sorry. Going yeah, on. certainly I can. So, okay. So Jay Pissette is the Volunteer and Community Engagement Coordinator for the Canadian Lesbian and Gay Archives. Jade is an anti-oppressive educator who has worked as an advocate in LGBTQ2 plus communities for over 10 years. They have previously worked at Kind, formerly Pink Triangle Services in Ottawa as an education programs coordinator and has worked with over 50 different organizations across Ontario to develop queer and trans inclusive policies. Dawn Owen is the curator of Guelph Museums where she is responsible for the art and artifact collections, exhibitions and educational programming and nurturing effective relationships with the community. Her work on the whole project and the sense of wonder exhibition from 2015 to 17 Exemplify her experience with engaging non traditional and underserved individuals and communities through collaborative and interactive partnerships. Prior to joining Guelph Museums in July 2017, Dawn was the curator of contemporary art at the Art Gallery of Guelph. She has worked in the public cultural sector since 1998. Thank you so much for everyone for joining us today. Great. So the agenda. Um, Donna, Jade, and Dawn will do their presentation, and then we will have some time for questions at the end. I'm now going to pass the mic to Donna to get us started. Welcome, Donna. Thank you. Can you hear me? Can. Yes. Wonderful. Hey, so first of all, thanks to all for uh, inviting me to participate in this. Uh, it's it's really a pleasure for me to talk to you today about the Toronto Ward Museum. Uh, the Toronto Ward Museum is a museum without walls, and I think probably all of you know what that means, but it, it means more than the fact we don't currently have a building, we have no plans to ever acquire 
building, um, and neither do we anticipate a building collections in any other form than possibly in the future digital ones. Now, this newness uh, has its complications, of course. Um, it means that we're in the process of building a stable financial foundation. We're still in the process of obtaining charitable status. And of course, we're still almost, almost completely uh, dependent on uh, volunteer and intern labor. But despite those changes, um, I think the advantage of being a new and being a museum without walls is that the TWM has been able from its begin about two years ago to make shared authority, include storytelling and the co-development and co-delivery of programming uh, central to its mission. And it, it has allowed then through collaboration to quite a lot actually in the past two years and we tend to see its achievements as a product of sharing of authority, a product of the co-development of programs that feature inclusive storytelling and we intend to go forward on that uh, conclusion into the future. So if you can give me the next slide please. You should actually be able to, if you want to press the arrows there, Donna, you should be able to move them ahead right. if you'd like to. Got it. I hope you can all see that now. So the idea for the Ward Museum as a museum without walls was initially developed by Gracia Dajalia, uh, a graduate of Concordia, along with a group of 30-something uh, uh, young professionals, most of them of immigrant and uh, second-generation Canadians. Um, in their preliminary discussions, uh, they believed that if them was to pursue the vision that you see uh, before you and to achieve a mission, which we've now expressed uh, in the form that you can see, it couldn't start by building wall collections. Instead, it, from the beginning, saw priming and community building around storytelling through the sharing of stories and dialogue on stories as its main goal. So why the name Ward Museum? One, because most people here in Toronto recognize the St. John's Ward as its first place of historical settlement for largely impoverished immigrants who were at that time perceived outsiders rather than as founders and builders of colonial Canada. Two, because specific neighborhoods are the site of most storytelling and community building in Toronto, even today, as it is and continues to be undertaken by new immigrant groups. And three, because immigrant neighborhoods in Toronto have always been a multicultural space where storytelling occurs, not only within specific cultural groups, but also across cultural barriers. So we use the word ward to signal our interest in the past. Um, we often talk about wards in the plural, however, uh, to signal our intention to uh, foster include storytelling across all of Toronto's neighborhoods. And in fact, understanding the historical multiculturalism that emerged in immigrant neighborhoods, that continues to emerge today in immigrant neighborhoods, is part of how we at the Ward hope by engaging with audiences to imagine a multicultural future in which immigrants are valued and active participants. So let's see if I can get the next slide. Ah, here we go. So the Ward Museum shared authority and the co-development of programs have meant many things, but most fundamentally it means that the Ward acts alone. And this highlights the logos of its founding partners who have been on board uh, with Gracia and uh, her co-workers from the beginning. Uh, this is just the list of the founding partners. Um, 
we have 15 partners and they are located in the heritage arts and culture sector in academia and in immigrant refugee services. The Ford Museum could not do its work without the in-kind support that it receives from partners in the form of offices, menu rooms, um, student community, faculty and intern staff, over. All of those partnerships create the foundation um, for the programming that we do, the research that we do, and the marketing of our programs that we do. In other words, to put Mass most bluntly, the sharing of authority is not just an institutional goal for the museum. The sharing of authority actually creates the structure of the institution itself. Uh, no. So there are many forms of diversity and inclusion, and there are many challenges to inclusion that can't actually be seen with the eye. Nevertheless, I've included a picture here of a recent partners meeting um, because it gives you at least one way of visually understanding um, the museum's partnering structure as institutional foundation. Its partners, as you can see here, are on the youngest side. Um, you will also um, be able uh, to see what is, in fact, our experience that the majority of our partners, uh, partners' representatives self-identify as female. All minorities constitute about half of uh, the partners in this photo, as they also uh, did in the same group who created the institution uh, at its origins. Getting to know each other, partners, and especially as developers of Ward Museum programming means that the Ward itself is always a site of storytelling um, and sharing of immigration stories and a dialogue about difference and commonalities, and that's true whether you attend a board meeting, a partners meeting, or our newest group, which is the programming uh, committee, which uh, will uh, uh, even more importance, I think, in the years I've had. Um, because, of, because I know are in museums that have existed a much longer uh, time uh, than the word, um, I know that you have to approach issues related to inclusivity and diversity in ways that match your own institutional histories, your missions, your visions, and even your institutional structures. You, uh, you may not have seen a partnership or inclusivity as um, the foundation for the building of the institution initially. So um, what we all share, I think, is an uh, interest in uh, inclusivity in programming and the sharing of authority through programming, I'm uh, going to spend the rest of my time here with you today just um, looking at some possible models uh, in the arena of uh, programming and the development of programming. And I'm going to use several of the Ward Museum's own uh, recent uh, programs as examples. Um, I also want to note to our hosts that I've uh, lost track of the time a little bit. Uh, and if you need, just send me a message when my uh, 15 to 20 minutes is coming to an end. Or can we agree on that? Yeah, I'll give you your time. Okay, that's yeah, right. Thank sure. you so much, yeah, Rhiannon. Not a uh, yeah, it looks like I'm now the host, so. Yeah, you're good. Another slide. I'm a little bit um, clumsy with this computer that I'm using, so bear me one minute. Okay, so um, one of our uh, first uh, programs was a social media cane called But I Still can't vote. And as I understand it, um, the idea for focusing on the civic 
participation of young people who cannot vote emerged initially uh, from uh, Gracia uh, Halia's discussions with the founding partners and social media to uh, reach out to and to reach uh, young people is sort of a brainer uh, in many respects. Uh, they use social media uh, far more frequently than people my age do. So the Toronto Award Museum in this program chose the focus, but then reached out to partners uh, both for critique and for sharing of authority in the further development of how and to whom we would reach out. Her house at the University of Toronto was one of the partners and the most important partners on this uh, project. And Stens at Hard House uh, helped to plan the media uh, campaign and, and then to uh, develop an online exhibit. Their choice was uh, to focus attention in the I Still Can't Vote uh, project on international students. To make a long story uh, short, with the assistance of Heart House and Student Outreach on social media, uh, students at the U of T were encouraged to tell their own stories and to offer reflections on how they viewed Toronto as their temporary or permanent home when they thought about what political participation might mean. So this is an example of a kind of inclusive storytelling, since it was the storytellers themselves who chose to participate or uh, and not. Uh, this program is also is a good reminder that when we think of inclusion, and especially when we think of inclusive storytelling, that storytelling is not the exclusive uh, right or obligation of, of older people uh, reflecting over their lives uh, retrospectively. Young people do have uh, stories uh, to tell, and social media allows them to make the choice of uh, whether or not to share it. And the notion that you own your own story um, is uh, part and parcel of a program like this that allows people to select in uh, or out. And what I particularly liked about this particular program was that it encouraged recent immigrants and international students to think about how they participated in Toronto and how they perceived Toronto as a civil society, since so much of storytelling um, is instead about how the receiving society perceives the immigrants. Let me give you um, at least one more example. Um, this is one of our most recent, largest, and uh, successful programs this year. And once again, as I, in, uh, I, I, I Still Can't Vote, a shared authority and partnership is the foundation. And what you see on the side there actually is uh, the number of partners with whom we worked with funding from Ontario 150. Um, if, oops, if you examine uh, the images that you see here in front of you, you'll also, um, I think, be happy to learn that Block by Block was launched as a partnership in three cities in Canada, not just in Toronto, but also in um, Montreal and in Vancouver. And in each of those three seas, uh, different uh, partnerships developed. Um, but all of them, especially in Ontario, uh, in Toronto, and in Montreal, young people uh, predominated. Uh, block by block, 
was a storytelling and somewhat celebratory event. In some cases, people were include, uh, encouraged uh, to share stories, in others uh, to share images and photos. The focus here being very much on the specific neighborhood and the telling of stories around uh, the particular uh, neighborhood in Montreal, for example, it was a cottage. Um, it is not the same partnership as uh, we used for the development but I, uh, of, of the uh, social media campaign that I uh, described I do, but uh, this is the very labor intensive part of programming at the Ward Museum is the development and the encouragement of partnerships that will produce a program which did differ in Vancouver, in uh, Montreal, and in Toronto, but were quite successful in attracting significant and very um, culturally uh, and and a spatially uh, diverse participation from both recent immigrants and longer time uh, Canadians. I think time to tell one more, or possibly uh, two more, if, if I keep them uh, brief. Not just numbers is a third uh, partnership um, that has been delivered to uh, public audiences, usually in partnership with uh, public libraries over the last year, and with funding now from a, a generous donor whom we hope to transfer into a partner at some point, uh, we're going uh, to be uh, transforming not just numbers soon into a toolkit for uh, teachers to use in schools. Not just numbers focuses on the Canadian census. It helps uh, participants uh, to think about what actually represented in the Canadian uh, census, and a team of young um, historians, uh, mostly in their 20s and 30s, developed uh, a seven or eight case studies of people identified in 19th century Toronto censuses, which they then supplemented with um, additional historical documentation. The purpose of numbers is to involve tables, which you see in front of you, of participants in interpreting both the census and the accompanying historical documents in order to develop um, an interpretive story of that individual's life in one neighborhood or another. And here the sharing of authority between the participants and the monitors and the uh, planners of the program so that the story they develop based on each group's unique interpretation of the materials. Every person at the table becomes an historian and the game-like, detective-like um, like or detective like um, process of uh, not just numbers is one of its appeals. I do have time, and then I'll conclude with one a final example, one in which I've uh, been uh, particularly oops, sorry, I guess I involved, uh, and that's um, ding up. I'm missing. Okay. Uh, Toronto. Uh, Ding up Toronto is again a partnership largely with uh, a research center at the University of Toronto at Scarborough and with immigrant food businessmen, largely restaurateurs, but also grocers and in a few cases industry leaders. Dish up Toronto has uh, developed. Uh, programs that have led walking tours through Kensington Market that have brought small groups of uh, uh, tourists, really, uh, to uh, visit Filipina and Filipino um, stores and to dine together in a restaurant. And 
and it's also offered an opportunity to share a home cooked uh, Ramadan breaking of the fast meal in a Muslim family in um, Mississauga, I believe it was. We're now planning a, a kind of celebratory multicultural theater. The idea here, again, is to feature the expertise and knowledge of the immigrant food uh, providers and to encourage the telling of stories over and around food. We did a very large dishing up Toronto event focusing on corn in the Americas as an opportunity to reach out to and to engage several of First Nations food persons. So my final thoughts here is that through a of planning that emphasizes partnerships and co-development, we aim to build good and lasting relationships, um, build mutual respect, trust, and collaboration among people who may not have otherwise known or work uh, together. And of course, one of our goals is to encourage um, those who tell stories at one event to remain in touch with us and possibly to become partners in developing new programs. With challenges, I'd be happy to answer questions, especially about those challenges, how we measure the impact of our programs. One might develop a fundraising model that is also based on partnerships with marginalized uh, communities, and especially at this moment, how um, the Ward Museum can encourage a storytelling that brings together uh, recent arrivals and uh, First Nations uh, organizations and peoples into dialogue and partnership. Thank you. Thank you so much, Donna, for um, your presentation. And I know there will probably be some questions at the end. Um, at this point, I want to invite Jade to speak. Um, so just give us one second. Um, can people? Yeah, I think we can hear you, Jane. You should okay. be able to control the slides. So if you want to move them along there with the arrows, you're good to go. Perfect. All right, so welcome, everyone. Uh, thank you, Rhiannon and Petal. Um, and uh, I, I love the, the contrast uh, with, with Donna because uh, we have a very different type of institution. Um, so I'm Jade. I'm the Volunteer and Community Outreach Coordinator at, at the Canadian Lesbian and Gay Archives. Uh, I use the pronouns they and them. Uh, and it's kind of funny how I, I got uh, involved in all of this because my background is not in heritage. It's not in information studies. It's not in museums, um, archives, or any of that. Uh, my background, as, as was stated, is in anti-oppression consulting and specifically LGBTQ work. So I'm coming from a bit of a different perspective on how we actually get beyond tokenism and create in inclusive institutions. Um, I'm also sick, unfortunately, so I may cough um, at points. Um, I apologize in advance. So who is the CLGA? So the CLGA is the largest independent LGBTQ2 plus archives in the entire world. Um, we focus on Canadian content in terms of our materials, um, and we, we focus on providing public access to those materials. Um, so that includes everything from, you know, uh, uh, personal papers, organizational papers, um, but also tons of varied varial from buttons, matchbooks, uh, music, or histories, um, tiaras, and uh, uh, a fairly large erotica collection as well, um, and even, uh, yes, Gamopoly, uh, which is apparently a thing uh, that I learned when starting to work here. Uh, so we started from humble beginnings. Um, we actually started in 973. Um, so we have a bit longer history um, than the, the Ward Museum. And so we're, we're kind of approaching this from a, a, a station that's been going through a lot of change. Um, so when we started, we, were, we started as part of the gay liberation newspaper, The Body Politic. Um, and so the organization was, was started by activists um, and journalists, not archivists or librarians. But soon after that, archivists and librarians became involved. Um, and by 1980, we became 
completely independent organization of the body politic and became one of the first LGBTQ2 plus charities actually in Canada in 1981. Um, and since we've gone through many, many changes, um, and since 2010 in particular, we've started to uh, evolve into broader than just an archive. Um, so we've been getting into the community, we've been in, engaging with material, um, and so a lot of this has been, been new for us in terms of how do we approach programming, how do we approach clues, um, because we have this long history. Um, so even though we, we already did a land acknowledgement at the beginning of this workshop, I, I think it's important for, for us to read ours as well. Um, so the Canadian Lesbian and Gay Archives is located on the traditional lands of the Mississaugas of New First Nation, the Honone, the Shnabe, and the Huron Wendat. Toronto is still the home to many Indigenous people across Turtle Island, and we're grateful for the op opportunity to work on this land. The GA strives to gather the stories of the unheard and silenced voices of the two LGBTQ plus first peoples of this land. We acknowledge that some stories have already been lost, and we need to ensure that those that remain and those that are to come are preserved in future. Uh, as a white settler uh, myself, I think it's important to, to recognize the territory we're on, and whenever we're talking about any type of inclusion work or do any type of work, um, we should be recognizing uh, that, especially when it comes to LGBTQ identities, these modern Western identities, and that as people have a long history here before colonization, um, their continued presence is important in our communities. Um, so many people, when I tell them that uh, we've had our, some of our own issues in terms of addressing um, issues of diversity and inclusion, have been actually kind of surprised because we're an LGBTQ2 plus organization. Um, but even though we are, uh, we're still susceptible to issues of um, uh, colonialism, racism, transphobia, sexism, ableism, and other challenges as any other organization would. Um, we historically have been an organization that's been mostly, not entirely, but mostly uh, white, male, and cis. Cis meaning people who identify with the gender or sex they were assigned at birth. Um, Interestingly, the organization has gone from a, a place of, of uh, one uh, group kind of dominated the organization to a place where we have increasing gender parity um, and even our staff team is mostly women now. Um, and we've been taking direct steps to engage communities that have not seen themselves historically at the CLG. Um, and so we're trying to do that in a holistic and tokenistic way. And the start of that has been with outreach. Um, so we started by forming a community engagement committee in 2006. Um, <coughs> and with that committee, uh, we started to actually get out of the archives. And one of the things that we, we have noticed in terms of of being important for engaging communities um, that haven't seen themselves represented is actually building that space. Um, so two of your things that community engagement has done over the years uh, has been tours. And so right here on the, the left is one of our walking tours, um, or I prefer to call them moving tours, frankly, because um, not everybody can walk that can move. And those we've done of the the Vidge as well as um, uh, downtown Toronto as well, because a lot of the older LGBTQ history is actually there, um, <coughs> as well as uh, tours of our house. Um, and so you can see there on the uh, the right um, a group of uh, Gender and Sexuality Alliance students who had come through, and I think we had 80, 80 students through that day from ages uh, seen all the way down to, I think, 10. Um, 
and actually getting out into community and seeing and showing community that there's actually a space for them to come has been important for us. Um, and we've also done presentations, of course, as well. Um, and we've really been trying to ramp that up in the, the past few years. Now, where we kind of have started to move into the museum sector in, in many more ways uh, was the forming of our curatorial committee. Uh, so our curatorial committee was formed out of community engagement in 2009 and to get put they put together about four exhibits a year until 2016 from for 2010 to 2016 um, to help bring in communities who previously wouldn't come as individual researchers um, so explicitly we wanted to uh, highlight works and materials associated with um, black indigenous and people of color communities um, women trans folks um, people who hadn't seen themselves here, and and, and actually rechange that that mindset that's out in the community about who we are and, and and what we do, and we're continuing to do that. But unfortunately, due to accessibility concerns, as you can see with our uh, picture of our house there, it is a heritage home. You can see people uh, sitting on uh, standing on steps, um, and it is very much not an accessible building. Um, we, we love our we love our permanent space, but we, it's also a challenge as well. Um, and so we have increasingly started to look at doing offsite exhibits. Um, and so this is uh, uh, connected to what so, uh, some of the stuff does. Been saying about partnerships being so important. And so upcoming, we actually have an exhibit of Mary Ross's work, who is a trans um, artist in. Um, as part of the Museum of Toronto Intersections Festival, uh, as well as looking at doing a pop-up exhibit at Scarborough Museum um, in September 2018 called Warren with Pride and possibly a third exhibit that's yet to be confirmed. So even though we've, we've stopped the in-house ones, we've been looking at how do we get out to community with our materials and showcase also the materials that we already have related to marginalized communities that have seen themselves. <coughs> One additional piece of outreach <coughs> is social media for us. Um, so the communications committee was formed uh, in a more holistic way in 2013. And particular communication volunteers have led the way in making our social media actually one of the most popular foreign archives uh, in Canada. Uh, for instance, we're the most popular archive in the GTA on Facebook, uh, the second most popular in Ontario behind Library and Archives Canada, um, and we all have a popular Twitter account and an Instagram account that we've had for a little over a year now. Um, we bring in people and, and engage with people who hadn't previously um, known about the CLGA. The thing is, is though, when we bring people in, they all have to feel safe and welcome in the space. So we had to do a bit of um, at ourselves. And so in 2016, um, the board of directors established some priorities in terms of ensuring that um, the CLGJ stays relevant and continues to contribute to LGBTQ2 plus communities and all LGBTQ2 plus communities. communities. And so one of the things that the former executive director, Glenn Brown, um, did was looked at doing an internal survey. And so this is us airing some of our dirty laundry, which is exciting for people, usually. Um, and so we actually did the, the survey internally of how do we see ourselves in terms of inviting people and welcoming people um, and materials into the archives. Because if we don't have materials from communities that have been more marginalized, um, then we'll be able to showcase them either. And so this was this was one of the stark slides in term, uh, from the report that we got, um, which was that it was very divided between men and women about how, how we were doing. And there were some non-binary folks who participated as well, but, but um, uh, they weren't as statistically relevant, so uh, unfortunately, not in this slide, uh, like myself. Um, and uh, so it, it was very uh, evident that we had some work to do internally, be able to 
able to do the work externally as well. And so one of the ways that we've actually done that is, is by getting input sessions uh, internally by, by folks within the organization, um, both formally and informally. Um, so especially the more marginalized folks within the organization, if they wish to contribute to diversity and inclusion work, they may, um, but we're also not going to single them out and say, hey, you know, you're trans or you're a person of color or you're, you know, a woman here engage with this process. Um, instead, let's have all of us engage with this process, talk about this process and see what we can do. And so one of the things that we decided to do was, was following up with this was actually um, mandated training for all uh, volunteers, staff and board on anti-racism, anti-oppression. Um, we called our diversity inclusion trainings. And so far to this date, we've actually been able to train internally uh, 56 people uh, who have gone through two trainings uh, and 27 more who have gone through one of the two already. And we plan to do more in future. So um, quite a number of people. A lot of those are our volunteers because we're a very small organization, but um, uh, volunteers are, are also drive the organization. So making sure that it's a, a good and welcoming space for them is important too. Um, it's a major piece that I want to, to get to, uh, and this is talking about the very concrete and physical, uh, because the concrete and physical is what allows us to do um, programming externally. Um, so it's the idea of passive collecting. So historically, we've been an institution which has just allowed material to come to us instead of searching out material. Um, and uh, one of the quotes that we have here is, we're only as good as what we've received. Um, and so to address some of that, uh, we need to look at some of our issues of homophily. Um, so homophily being the idea of like attracting like or love the same. Um, so if the people who are here are all of are, are all white settlers, are all male, are all cis, uh, and all these things, they we wouldn't necessarily see as much material from Black, Indigenous, and people of communities, from trans communities, from women, and so we've really been trying to to change some of that. Um, by explicitly going out to communities and, and saying, Let's, you know, bring in for a free tour. Like, only some of our programming we would, um, we would uh, try for um, a fee. Uh, but in cases where it's a community that hasn't seen themselves here, we'll wait a fee. And I think that's, that's important. Um, and I think it's tokenistic there because we're not singing out specific individuals, um, but instead actively outreaching to, to groups that we want to see their records here, and we want to be able to partner with and promote records in future. <clears throat> Pieces for us moving forward um, have really been the idea of changing from an a collecting institution to an active collecting institution, doing those pieces of, of explicit training um, and, and centralizing you know, equity, access, and anti-racism and anti-oppression within the organization. Um, it also is including a name change. Um, so we heard from community that they do not, not everybody sees themselves represented in, in an organization that has only lesbian gay in the title. And so that's important for us in terms of creating a new um, new name that uh, will be well in more people. And we're actually in that process right now, and we'll be announcing a new name um, to our membership for our membership to vote on um, later this year, which is really, really exciting. Um, so two of the images that, that are above right here is um, a, one of our front of our internal exhibits, which was an exhibit of, of photographs uh, specifically of different LGBTQ uh, Torontonians who'd made significant impact 
Um, it was called We Could Be Heroes Just for One Day. Um, and currently, they, it, or in the uh, image, uh, was actually a partnership with the Toronto Comic Arts Festival. Um, so really partnering with, with people we wouldn't necessarily always think of in the same way in terms of heritage, um, in terms of uh, materials. And then on the right, uh, is from one of the other house tours that that we gave, um, and so they're all uh, first year students. And one of the things we've really found is with, with bringing high school students and um, university students, they're on bridge we had in terms of diversity and inclusion already, um, even than than my generation. Um, and uh, it's it's really quite amazing when you people in and provide them a space and just as a as, as a tip, everybody seems to love button. <laughs> um, no matter no matter where they come from. Uh, so the final piece um, for us is doing more partnerships. Uh, we can't get beyond uh, being in, trapped in our own space in some ways um, and be able to include people unless we do partnerships. So similar to what Donna was saying in terms of, of partnerships being the way to go. Um, and I know it's kind of become a buzzword in many ways, but it's also true. Um, so above on the left here was an exhibit that we did with Montgomery's Inn um, uh, called More with Pride. Um, and so, you know, Montgomery's Inn is, is in uh, the... Um, Tobacco. Um, so getting outside of the downtown core and, and with our upcoming exhibit that will be somewhat similar at Scarborough Museum in 2018, it's again getting out of the downtown core, getting out of you know our own little uh, niche bubble and community um, to actually engage with, with people who are, are much more diverse. Um, on the right was fr from a launch of some of our trans materials. Um, uh, it was a partnership with the LGBTQ Digital Oral History Laboratory, uh, which was SHRC grant actually to uh, both record as well as digitize oral histories. Um, they've been able to prioritize some more marginalized histories within that. Um, we also have had partnerships with organizations like Heritage Toronto for our walking tours. Um, recently, we recreated a um, an education timeline, uh, which I can post in the chat later, uh, with the Entry Teachers Federation of Ontario. So really looking at uh, groups that archives didn't necessarily think about as much in terms of engaging with, we've been trying to do that as well. Um, so this has included, um, you know, uh, senior centers, um, you know, youth groups, a, a queer so songbook orchestra. Um, so we actually did a partnership with an orchestra, which has led to oral histories being recorded. Um, more recently, uh, we we partnered uh, as part of the uh, Family Camera Project uh, as well, which is uh, another big project that recently had a um, exhibit actually at the ROM, uh, so a more conventional institution per se. Um, but also been looking at the ability to get outside of the GTA itself, um, because I think when we we talk about inclusion, we don't always think about geography as well, um, and that is an important piece in terms of engaging with communities. So getting out to you know other communities in the GTA, um, so you know other parts of the GTA, whether that's North York or Britain, um or you know. Um, um, I recently did a presentation in uh, with some of our duplicate materials um, in in uh, way out, way out. Um, and so all of these different partnerships have allowed us to get out of our traditional core and to engage with communities um, haven't seen themselves represented here, and then once they get here, actually feel like are represented uh, and more than represented but actually have a voice at the table so thank you
Perfect. Thank you so much, Jade. That was great, and I'm sure there will be um, some questions at the end. So at this point, I'm going to invite Dawn to speak. Um, and so just give us a second as we just transfer um, the presenter privileges to Dawn. So one second. You should be good to go. So if you want to use the arrows there, you should be able to move your slides. Yep. Can you hear me all right? We can, yes. Terrific. I'm really delighted to be presenting in the context of this uh, of this webinar um, and with my colleagues at the ward and the CGA, soon to be renamed. Um, uh, and I I, I am um, I think the projects that I am going to art uh, share with you today, um, you will see that there are um, consistencies between the projects that have both have been articulated by my co-presenters. Ready. Uh, I will start with just a brief um, explanation of where the projects come from. There are two that I will highlight today. Um, a prior to arriving at Guelph Museums in July of this year, spent the previous 19 years at the Art Gallery of Guelph, formerly known as the McDonald Stewart Art Center. The Art Gallery, excuse me, Art Gallery of Guelph, I'll refer to as AGG. Um, is uh, situated in Guelph, as is, of course, Guelph Museums. And we do have, uh, it's a fairly, Guelph is a fairly um, small community, about 120,000 people. And so we have, you know, shared responsibilities, both the AGG and Guelph Museums. And I think, um, and of, of course, similar challenges. And I think uh, the projects that I'm gonna, going to highlight today um, you know, projects in and of themselves, I think, but they do articulate some of those greater needs that um, that we all share. Um, and our challenges at both at the AGG and Guelph Museums are to tell Guelph stories differently and to position Guelph in the pre-Confederation and also in the Canadian context. Um, so the challenges that are consistent with all of the projects, and I would suggest perhaps even with the projects of, that my co presenters have, have um, shared with us today, really late around agency, bridge building, social practices, and partnerships. Uh, there's that word again. Um, so in, in context of giving agency is that uh, as organizations and as uh, museum professionals in those organizations, it's really an obligation of not just um, building agency both within and on behalf of our organizations, but to give that agency or to provide platforms of ag agency um, to the community at large, and then also to the, um, the communities beyond those borders. Um, and in the context of the projects I'm sharing with you today, that really deal, that really, um, the agency building piece is um, uh, sort of revolved around a collaboration between artists, institutions, and communities. Um, the second challenge, of course, is bridge building in, my, uh, in, in the context of these projects. And um, what I mean by that is that there are existing bridges, there are bridges that once existed but no longer exist, uh, and, and then there are the bridges that need to be built. And, um, you know, I, uh, professionally speaking, worked from within organizations, and um, it, it can be very difficult to get beyond that bricks and mortar. Um, so it's fascinating to me that at the word and a, a largely a lot of the work coming out of the CL, CLJ really focuses on getting beyond those those frameworks, those traditional frameworks. And that is exactly the challenges that we're dealing with here, both at the AGG and Guelph Museums. Social practices um, in the context uh, specifically of creative uh, creatives. So um, visual art is an example of a creative social practice, but then there are um, many, many others, of course. Um, and through social practices, there is sort of an essential need to, uh, or essential premise that invites um, the uh, community at large to um, not just have a voice, but to actually create and share um, organization and through the organization, so both within and without. Um, and a, a colleague of mine who uh, I connected with just this past Monday said, instead of outreach, we need to talk about in-reach as well, because that is sort of the, um, the journey that we take. We're, we're, we're moving out, but we're also moving in, so it's always reciprocal. And of course, being uh, partnerships, which uh, 
frankly, these ki this kind of work can't be done without partnerships. And I don't mean that as a token phrase. I mean that very earnestly. And um, you'll see, and, and I'll move to the first prior. Um, you'll see this articulated, the notion of partnerships and the importance of partnerships um, are highlighted as fundamental pieces of, the, uh, of these two projects. So the first project I'm going to discuss today is the Mush Hole Project. And I would encourage everybody listening to go to mushholeproject.ca um, if you want to know more about it. Um, because I can't, in the space of this presentation, possibly tell you everything about it. So I would encourage you to go there, mushholeproject.ca. Um, you can see that in this slide, I've just highlighted some of the collaborative um, organizations that were involved with this project. Um, this is just a short list compared to the extensively long list of collaborators, both organizations and individuals, uh, without whom um, the whole project itself would not have happened. The principal partners in this are um, related at the top of that list, the Woodland Cultural Center, um, Native Women in the Arts, and the Waterloo Aboriginal Education Center at the University of Waterloo. Um, those are, that's the, sort of the trifecta mush, mush hole project that um, brought all of the other collaborators together, including myself and the Art Gallery of Guelph. And I just, just uh, forgive me, the small text on this slide. Um, the, uh, the curatorial committee, so in terms of the creative components of the Mush Hole Project, I just wanted to put out there at the beginning that I was one of six individuals and many others also that informed this process, um, but one of six that um, participated on the curatorial committee. So um, again, just to highlight collaboration um, and partnership, that is also another level of that. Uh, and then the themes for the Mush Hole Project uh, really circulated around um, education, reconciliation, and truth. And, um, I'll read the details there. I'll just invite you to do so. Um, but I wanted to present those as the core uh, pillars of the project. Uh, and so in this context, even though I, at the time, as a contemporary art curator, was working in a contemporary art gallery. Um, we were really driving at bigger issues in terms of articulating the need and um, value and the meaning of the Mush Hole Project. Uh, and so art was really just a tool, an expressive tool. And I think it was, um, you'll, I, th I hope that you'll find, and certainly we found, that that was a great way to, to drive at these issues uh, also unpack them. Uh, I'll just take you to the beginning of the project, and what you can see here is there is a photo on the left of the uh, Mohawk Residential School, uh, which is in Brantford and on the grounds of the Woodland Cultural Center. And beside that on the right is a photo of the um, Art Gallery of Guelph building. And you can see just how similar these two structures are. In fact, they were both built in 1904 and they have an identical footprint. They both also created as a um, piece of education, quote unquote. Um, the Art Gallery of Guelph in its 40 year history was um, sort of prided itself on its uh, origins as an educational site, as one of Ontario's first public um, school. Uh, and it, you know, basically uh, what happened in 1904 is that after the building was built, there was, um, a bum that picked up rural children from all of the farm uh, farming communities that s surrounded this area and brought them to one place to teach them, um, both girls and boys. And, um, you know, we, we've long said uh, at the AGG that, um, you know, community broadly that our pride in that sort of educational history. Well, simultaneously in Brantford in 1904, this building was constructed, again, identical footprint, not very far, geographically speaking, from the Gallery of Guelph and or then the McDonald Institute, as it was known when it was originally a school. And the the uh, Mohawk Institute, also on the premise of education, but one that was really concerned with assimilation and, um, in quote, uh, um, aggressively uh, assimilating 
the uh, the indigenous peoples um, of the area, and it it uh, performed as a school for many, many years. Almost um, actually, it the building itself, this building that you can see in the picture, is from 1904. Um, however, it was built much earlier than that, and there were two previous buildings on that site that burnt down. Um, and so I just wanted to articulate that still in 1904, after years of this work, um, these sites being established um, through education, but with very different um, sites. So that was really the, uh, the impetus for me uh, as being the curator of the Art Gallery of Guelph to get involved with the Mushhole Project, because I recognized that there was um, an opportunity around agency in terms of um, identifying and, and querying and being critical about our educational history at the AGG and tethering that to the simultaneous moments and what, what was happening in Brantford at the Mohawk Institute. Uh, sorry, I'm just toggling between these slides here. So, um, so it was an absolutely uh, critical moment for the AGG to really um, engage with the truth and reconciliation um, calls to action that, and um, this is about 2015, um, that really uh, necessitated that the Art Gallery of Guelph, although for almost 40 years, had been very involved with Indigenous communities and artists and had created a long history of exhibitions and um, scholarship and collection, collecting practices with and, and, um, and in collaboration with uh, Indigenous artists and communities really needed to get outside of itself and to, be, to, and to participate as, an, as a community agent um, in a different way. And uh, what I wanted to articulate also simultaneously to that moment is, is the work we did with Guelph artist Don Russell uh, is uh, of Indigenous heritage, and sort of simultaneous to this moment, and um, while it was, and at the launch of the Mushhole Project, um, we had uh, been working. The AGG had been working with Don Russell on the installation of a new um, land-based sculpture, Circle Mound, which you can see pictured here. I will just show you a larger image of it. Um, that uh, was situated in the public sculpture park that surrounds the Art Gallery of Guelph. And the reason, one of the reasons for um, commissioning this sculpture was really to um, effectively introduce uh, a different kind of making in that public sculpture park. Um, most, of which, most of the other sculptures um, are bronze and um, uh, of different metals of different sustainable materials. Uh, and then uh, this piece was really meant to grow and live and thrive and be used very differently and for it to live very differently in the sculpture park. Um, and so the commission of this piece happened in parallel with the Mushhole project and the piece itself was unveiled um, at the launch of that project. And uh, you can see here, uh, this is almost a year later uh, from the launch, which was in um, September of 2016, and you can see that um, this is an example of one collaboration where the circle itself, which is the sacred symbol in Indigenous cultures um, and in many other cultures around the world, frankly, um, that it was really meant to be a gathering place. It's meant to be a stage. It's meant to be private. It's meant to be public. Um, really, it achieves a lot of end goals, and we had an opportunity to further develop this landscape, the planting of the sacred strawberry plant. Um, and uh, this is a, a collaboration between a uh, grade eight school group um, from the, um, the Eagle program, which really looks uh, to um, provide opportunities to indigenous youth um, around furthering their education beyond high, high school. This group was coming to the gallery and uh, there was an opportunity here to fully engage them with the further development of this piece. And so sharing a few images, uh, Donsel, pictured here with the shovel, um, of course, is the artist, the creator of, of Circle Mound. And the woman crouched in this picture is uh, another artist in the Guelph community, Christina Kingsbury, who um, is also a social practice artist and uh, has worked extensively on the rehabilitation of some of our landfill sites here in Guelph. And she and Dawn started a conversation. And so when we invited Dawn to work with the Eagle Group on the planting of the strawberry, um, the strawberries, uh, he said, well, 
you know, I think it's important that if we're talking about the rehabilitation of land, we need to involve also Chris Kingsbury in this dialogue. And she was, um, we were grateful that she agreed to participate in that. So just artic articulate um, how, how that site in particular grew out of the Mush Hole project. And uh, I just wanted to share with you very quickly these two slides and I'll sort of move between them for just a second. These are all of the artists um, that were participated in the Mush Hole Project. And I should have said at the beginning, but I'll say it now, um, that term, the Mush Hole, is actually one um, that was given to the Mohawk Residential School um, by the survivors, by, by the students that uh, went there, the individuals that went there. And in the process of developing the Mush Hole Project itself, uh, a deep and prolonged collaboration with the Mush Hole survivors. And it was so called the Mush Hole because um, that is primarily the food that was provided. Um, so it wasn't about nourishment, it was just about sort of their sense. And the, the students, survivors of, of the Mohawk Institute, dubbed it the Mush Hole. And so, with agreement and support, we also ca um, called the Mush Hole Project. I'm going to switch and talk about another exhibition, or no, it became an exhibition, but another collaborative venture um, around uh, case. It was uh, with, with the um, deaf and hard of hearing uh, community, and uh, it was called A Sense of Wonder. Um, the Wonder Project and the Mush Hole Project started almost simultaneously. So I think you'll recognize that there are some, there's some continuity in approach and process. Um, and I will start to tell you a little bit about that. Uh, the mush, excuse me, the, uh, the project, the Wonder Project, as I like to call it, wrote because uh, through both um, personal, a personal process, so myself as curator and then my personal experience with deafness, and the, um, the opportunity or perhaps the challenge that was put out to all cultural um, institutions in Canada, um, but and also very specifically in Ontario, to think about deaf cultures as uh, you know in new and innovative ways. And I recognized as curator at the time at the Art Gallery of Guelph that um, had no meaningful relationship with the deaf community. We didn't know who they were. Um, this, um, we were quite sure what we were quite sure of was that they were not utilizing the art gallery's um, um, exhibitions or other sort of extension projects. And um, so we had a lot of, frankly, a lot of work to do. Unlike the where we had, you know, almost 40 years of collaboration with Indigenous artists and other creatives and organizations. In the context of the deaf and hard of hearing communities, we, we had to start from scratch. And so the response to that, um, from my perspective, again, as curator, was to, to invite um, a social practices artist. Her name is Dawn Matheson. She's also based in Guelph here, to um, work with on, frankly, a long journey. It was um, over years in development. And a journey that essentially took us, um, uh, it was a path that we, you know, we crafted, but we learned from and developed and evolved over time. So there was a dependence in this case on sort of a fixed outcome, except that we wanted to build bridges between the Lurie and the Guelph community at large and the um, deaf and hard of hearing communities. And I will just move to the slide. Again, partnership was critically important. Uh, Don Matheson, um, basic Don Matheson, we started to build relationships and trust within deaf culture. And we started to seek uh, community partners in order to help us to do that work. One is Silence Guelph, uh, pictured here which is um, a music organization, um, however, you know, interestingly called Silence. And the, they were essential collaborators on uh, one, of the, one of the workshops, which was called Feels Like Music. And in this image, you can see one of the musicians from Silence um, and some of the participants. 
students. And, uh, that's the way a sense of wonder developed through the leadership of Don Matheson to create agency and opportunity within the deaf community to create a series of workshops um, which were then documented. Dawn is a media artist, so she was primarily interested in capturing video and um, audio, even though it was a, uh, a deaf project. And um, the, this is an example of, of one of the workshops, which resulted in, in a video called Feels Like Music. Um, I just everybody know that uh, the, there is a very, very short video. You you can see that it's 12 seconds long. I've just done a, a stick here. I would encourage um, everybody listening to, if you're interested in this project, to just go to this, um, to YouTube at this link. And I will, it's been aired there. Um, so, and as I said, it's a 12 second video, but it really articulates sort of the value and the, the sort of the speed of interaction that this um, particular workshop represented. I'm aware of my time, so I'll just um, take a few more minutes. Organization that we worked with was called the is called the Guelph Outdoor School, and you can see their mandate there. And through them and a host of the Guelph community, we developed both a workshop and um, the resulting video uh, called "If a Tree Falls." So, um, which was a very interesting project. Um, the students. Uh, I just have a couple of images to share with you here. They were, um, they really directed the themselves, and we had uh, GoPro um, equipment, which was loaned to us from across the local community here, um, so that the both the participants and Don Matheson and her collaborators at Ed Video Media Arts Center here in Guelph um, could uh, capture a whole broad range of video. And it resulted in the project feels like music. The other essential collaborator in that project is EC Drury School for the Deaf, Deaf excuse me, which is um, based in Milton. And um, what we learned through the course of this project is that in the Guelph community, there is um, there is very little service or development of opportunity for with both within deaf culture, and so we learned that we really had to go to those communities in a different way, and EC Drury was an essential component of that. In fact, most of the participants in the project came from that, uh, came from that school. And then uh, our third um, workshop and video that was created uh, called All Together Now, and this is a still from that video, and this group of young participants, also from EC Drury, um, are I guess deaf plus, which means they have deafness, but they also have other challenges um, that uh, complicate their engagement with the traditional world, um, with the um, uh, with the broad community. And through this project, we were able to give them opportunity and agency to have their own voice. Um, the last but very essential partner was 10C. Uh, which is an organization in Guelph that really strives again um, to establish change and collaboration, and, or change through collaboration. And they allowed us to project a video um, throughout the duration of the uh, of the exhibition that became a sense of wonder at the end of this almost two year journey. And uh, that was projected in in the windows of. See, they were in the middle of a major renovation at the time in, in our downtown core here in Guelph, and that video played every single night for the duration of the exhibition itself, which was almost um, just over four months long. And there was no annotation of the video. It was simply this, um, this video, which featured a young um, deaf actress, uh, nine years old, who um, interpreted an SL, uh, an E.E. E. Cummings poem. And absolutely magical and poetic, and you know, without the annotation, it just invited people to, um, you know, watch and to think and to respond in kind. And it was brilliant to be able to get it to, to do that kind of work in uh, not in the gallery itself, but in the downtown core of Guelph. So, uh, end here. I'm slightly over time. Apologize for that. Um, with just a couple of images here, you can see Dawn Matheson at the microphone and beside her, Paula, one of our ASL interpreters. And of the lessons that we learned through that project was that um, the conventions uh, that we customarily follow 
in terms of engaging with our communities and individuals within those communities around sort of how we gesture, how we touch or not touch, et cetera, are, are very different within deaf culture. Um, so that you can see that the pointing here is an essential communication tool and one that we don't typically do or we try not to do rather in other sort of social um, circles. And this became a big learning curve for us that we had to communicate if not through a specific language, through gesture in a very meaningful way. Um, and I'll, I'll end my presentation on this image, which is just from the opening itself. And um, it was it probably the, the second largest uh, single response from the community to an exhibition that the Art Gallery had done in the last 40 years. And it was absolutely extraordinary. I've uh, folks from all, um, all age groups, all sort of scopes within the community really responded to it and um, there were hefty sort of interactive components up to life in the exhibition context, some of the workshop work that we had done um, over the previous two years. So I think there, thanks very much. Perfect, thank you so much, John. That, that was wonderful and I'm sure there'll be some, some questions. Um, so I'm just gonna transfer. So at this time, uh, we do have some time for questions. Um, so if people have questions, there's the chat box there that you can type your questions. And I can reload those, relay those to the presenters. Um, so we did see some messages coming in, so um, big thanks uh, to the presenters for, for wonderful, inspiring work. Um, Donna, I see you have a question, so actually I'm just going to... Uh, yes. Did you have a question? Oh, yeah, I did, actually. Um, so in uh, two of the cases that we looked at today, there is a, a kind of a, a broad core group, immigrants in my case, and the LGBTQ um, community in the other. And when we address inclusivity and seek diversity, it's both within that group and in that group's interactions with those outside. And that's maybe different from what we're seeing in the third case. And I, I'm just intrigued to hear um, thoughts from either about that balance between the focus on, you know, the particular group that's key to our missions and the other kinds of intersections which are inevitably there and are, might be a part of a mix of the program, but how large a part of the mix. Yeah, uh, Dawn or Jade, did you want to... Sure. Um, so I, I think when we talk about LGBTQ communities, to plus communities, um, in our case, it's it's challenging, right? Because those are our our white European Western English uh, words and and context. Even Two Spirit was created only in the 80s, uh, late 80s, uh, to recognize certain identities. And so sometimes even using those terms hold us, holds us back in some ways. Um, and instead, we get out into the community and say less that um, we are, you know, just old pieces and more just we're looking at our histories and this community um, and where are the fits within the community. And so, for us, getting out into and engaging with other communities that don't necessarily have LGBTQ2 plus in the title doesn't mean that we're not still engaging with LGBTQ2 plus people, if that makes sense. Um, so we need to get out into groups um, and work with groups that, that don't explicitly identify themselves as such um, because those communities are out there. Um, not everybody feels comfortable or safe or is out. Um, and so for our case, it's, it's, it's a bit different in that regard um, because, 
you know, terms that we use to identify our, our organization and the communities we work with um, only get so far, and they hold us back, too. Um, so, yeah. Thank you, Jade. Oh, sorry. No, go ahead. Didn't mean to interrupt you. Thank you, Jade, for that response to for the question, Donna. Um, yeah, absolutely. Everything we engage in from our mandates to the specific projects that we undertake um, are full of complexities. Uh, and it, I would suggest that it's impossible to um, take those journeys if we are trying to be everything to everyone all the time. Um, I agree with Jade's um, uh, perspective in the sense that even though I've articulated in this presentation two projects, the first that really drove um, towards um, agency building within indigenous communities, and then the second through deaf and hard of hearing cultures. Um, you know, so I was invited to speak on those, I think, because um, they were really sort of case studies, I think, for the broader um, quotients uh, that need to go into every project in order for us to be inclusive, but then um, to not be too restrictive of how people decide to engage and to perform inclusivity. And I would suggest that, um, you know, me, those quotients are, and, and these are universal, I would apply this to any project, um, time collaboration, which we've talked about extensively, um, process, uh, and listening, and fundamentally in terms of outcomes, um, allowing the process to dictate the outcomes. And so then you end up with a project that is um, essentially responsive and driven not by the institution, but by the collaborators and participants who are engaged with the project itself. Um, so we do have another question here. So the question is, can each of you speak to what you found most unexpected or surprising in your partnerships and inclusion projects? Sure. Start. Oh, no, go ahead. Is that right? Go, yeah, uh, go ahead, John. I think, well, I think that's a great question, and I think probably every project inspires um, its, own, its own surprises. If you do it right, I frankly think that you should have more surprises and more questions at the end of a project than you do at the beginning. Um, uh, for me, in the context of the Mushhole project and a sense of wonder, it was really uh, the, the, the deepest and most meaningful sort of transformative moments. So rather than surprise, I would say moments of transformation came um, on in you know through one-on-one -on -one interaction and in the context of the Wonder project. Um, because there was not just a cultural barrier, but a language barrier, um, and the deaf community is an incredibly complex community. Um, it's just so simple for me to refer to that group that way. But um, one of the things that we had to learn was to change the way in which we performed our roles as both individuals and as an institution, and the surprises came from you know, the ways in which we were invited to do that and which we found to do that um, because we had at the core of the goal to achieve these creative, um, these creative uh, practices and reveal them to the public in the context initially of the exhibition and then a whole host of things have happened after that, um, after that moment. But for me, around sort of the retooling or the rejigging of our practices, both in the context of our museum work, but our individual sort of social norms that we would undertake in that, the context of that project were extremely challenged, and um, the outcomes were very surprising. Donna, did you have a, a comment? Yes, just very quickly. For me, the real surprise came uh, in the context of the Not Just Not program on the Canadian Census, where uh, there was reluctance on the part of especially older, uh, both immigrant and longtime Canadian participants, to share authority in interpreting the census and the past. Um, it was not uncommon for um, some of the participants to, they wanted to come up with the right answer, the right story, the right interpretation, and they saw the moderator as the person who held that authority. Young people of all backgrounds, by contrast, were 
absolutely into challenging and uh, the authority of the moderator sharing authority within the group. But for some other uh, participants, um, the sharing of authority was a little uncomfortable. Great. And Judith? And so one of the things that I've found perhaps most surprising was actually in regards to intergenerational work. Uh, and, and so similar to, to sometimes, you know, um, older communities are sometimes are a bit more reluctant to change, but I also find that some of that happens with younger folks too, because um, we all come from our own perspectives. But the it's been really, really neat seeing how intergenerationally people can work together and how more gets done that way. And I think that's that's something that's been the most surprising in some of our, our outreach work and partnerships is how you connect um, a, an older person, um, a senior, um, an elder, um, or and a youth, whether that's a teenager or, or millennial or the like, um, really amazing things come out of it. So. I am mindful of the time, but we just have one quick question that I'm just going to put to the, to the presenters before we close. Uh, and that question is, so each of you have sort of spoken to the importance of partnerships. And so one of our attendees would be interested in knowing what do you consider to be an important tip on creating new and successful partnerships, or new and successful partnerships? Um, again, very briefly, and this may seem completely obvious, but face to face and all group meeting really us, but I think it's absolutely essential. You can't partner virtually or in, um, in the way we're communicating right now. Yes, yeah. great, Donna. Uh, I would agree 100%. Um, it really is about people working with people, um, and sometimes the most meaningful. Uh, of any process, of any journey, like we've all articulated, um, in, in those intimate, those more intimate moments, and then we learn and grow from that. So I, you know, from my perspective, I think um, what to do as institutions is to create platforms through which people can connect with other people, people, in very direct and meaningful ways, and to allow those participants to be creatives within the process and not to be too um, committed or resolute about what the outcome may be, but to allow that journey to be what it is and to, you know, the agencies and individuals who work in those agencies can, um, can provide a path, but that path will change and grow over time. And so oftentimes we're, we're racing through to completion, whether that's due to fund issues or other challenges. Um, it's so incredibly important to allow there to be time for relationship building. And um, so we've just got a couple more. We'll just see if we can quickly get through some of these. Um, so Don, this is a question specifically for you. You mentioned that the original inspiration for the Deaf Hard of Hearing project was government incentive. Is that right? Um, and also um, your personal experience. And she, uh, uh, this one's wondering if you can speak to the popularity of the event and the change that you've seen in the museum's perspective. I'm sorry, that last bit was about change? Yeah. Okay. So, uh, um, absolutely. So, uh, I mean, it was that, so my personal um, experience um, be with deafness began, frankly, when my niece was born uh, seven years ago. She was born deaf. And prior to that moment, I really couldn't articulate a, um, a personally uh, meaningful engagement or interaction with deaf culture prior to that moment. And uh, so my niece was born into a family that was, um, you know, for whom deaf was a, deafness was a very um, a foreign experience. We didn't uh, understand it. And so we have grown and developed as a family and learned, frankly, through my niece, um, was to her. And I was searching for ways to uh, bring that personal experience into a public experience. And I, um, so, so fully and partly inspired by the fact that, um, you know, our larger governmental mandates 
do ask of our institutions to look closely or look in different specific directions. And one of the directives at the time coming out of the Ontario Arts Council was around the engagement of um, deaf creative practices. And my, my response to that was to marry together my personal experience with this, um, this sort of bridge building approach um, through the AGG because I recognized that there, you know, that we frankly just didn't see or know who the who the deaf community was, and I didn't feel that we could produce creative work, um, i.e., exhibitions and scholarship and collecting in that direction without first building a relationship with the people who identify as deaf or hard of hearing. And, sorry, I'm, I'm going on a bit, but um, but essentially, so that that was the journey that we, we took, and uh, and so that is the platform upon which now. Um, we, well, I'm not with the AGG anymore, so I can't specifically speak to how they're furthering that agenda um, or that process or taking their cues from it, but certainly, you know, we'll see. Um, it was a fundamental change, a fundamental shift in the organization. For um, sort of quick question here, so we have someone um, from the Multicultural History Society of Ontario, um, and the comment here is um, that the so the MHSO believes equity in programming requires long-term commitments to partnerships with realized and Indigenous communities and the provision of substantial resources to the communities to enable and compensate for their full participation. Have you had any thoughts to this? I don't, want to take, I don't want to take time from my co-presenters, but mm -hmm. um, just briefly, uh, what I would say is absolutely in the context of the Mushhole Project, one of the challenges, well, so funding is always a challenge. Um, and, uh, you know, the big question is, do, you know, does an organization like the Art Gallery of Guelph or my new organization, Guelph Museums, um, you know, as an example, do we seek funding and do we take the funding and operate, you know, fuel the projects within those communities. So for example, in this context, the indigenous communities. Um, is it appropriate for us to be the leader on that? Um, in the context of the Mush Hole project, there were massive collection of people who co-wrote both Canada Council for the Arts and Ontario Arts Council grants. The Canada Council one was not successful. The Ontario Arts Council one was at vastly different funding levels. But the critical thing there was that um, because they're co-written, collectively written, the funding for the project was, was largely given to the Indigenous community and the organizations and individuals who are participants in the project. And so the AGG in that example received absolutely no funding, um, direct funding for that project. And so we, we sourced our, you know, we, we resourced it differently. Um, and uh, because we, and in fact, we took some of our resources and added to the pool of funds that, you know, the province had provided. And so, I think that's a, an important thing because we're often sort of as institutions looking to raise money with our institutions and for our institutions, but I believe that it is, is equal and perhaps more critically important for institutions to support applications that are born out of the communities we're working with. Thank you. Um, so I think there's just one last comment here and then uh, I'm going to pass it over to Pella just to take us, um, just to sort of wrap us up. Um, so this is a question, so um, the comment is, for me, there's a gut reaction to the term outreach, which I have not articulated very well, but which just feels like it's not an approach or attitude that I wish to be part of. So this particular um, attendee switched to the word engagement, and so thoughts on that? I can um, respond briefly to that one. Mm -hmm. out outreach is not a word that we commonly use in mm -hmm. At the Ward Museum, and speaking personally, I uh, see partnerships as um, an alternative strategy for accomplishing what historically, traditionally, outreach has uh, uh, described. Uh, it's, but it's a way of working in which, you know, knowledge and expertise doesn't travel outward, but I think one used the word inward, where there's an exchange of expertise through partnership, and to me that replaces outreach. I think in our case, um, 
we we have the issue of we have a physical space and so for us it is getting out of our physical space and that's one of the, one of the reasons why we use outreach because we want to look at how we get out of the the four walls that that trap us um, but that said, our our outreach committee is called community engagement also for a reason because we're we're looking at doing more than just outside of the house Perfect for that. So I think, um, Pedal, I'm just going to pass it over to you. Um, <coughs> well, I've learned so much this past hour and a half. I don't want it to end right now because I love the question and answers, but I'd really like to take this opportunity to say thank you to Donna and Jade and Dawn for sharing with us today. And again, we'd like to thank our project partners, the ROM, the Canadian Centre for Diversity and Inclusion, and as well the Ontario Ministry of Citizenship and Immigration for the support in this webinar. We'd also like to say a big thank you to Rhiannon. You've done a great job organizing this. Thank you so much. And of course, we wouldn't have Rhiannon and her fabulous work if it wasn't for Marie Lalonde, who's our ED of the OMA. Thank you for doing all this work. Um, we also, I hope today's presentation has presented an opportunity to reflect on and consider how we continue this work towards authentic, authentically engaging with communities, moving forward, and supporting equity and inclusion within our institutions. Thanks everyone who signed on today for your participation, and only because we want to make these webinars better and for you and participants, please, when you leave the web webinar, you'll be directed to a short evaluation form. Please take a few minutes and fill those out and help us make it better. And in closing, we'd like you to go to your calendars and mark down March 23rd, 2018, because that's when the Inclusive Museum Leadership Symposium will be happening at the Ontario Science Centre in Toronto. So thank you so much for today and enjoy the rest of this wonderful day. Thank you. Uh, thanks to all our panelists, and uh, I will follow up. But that was great, and thank you for uh, sharing your your good work. And I did forget to mention that there's another webinar, fourth M webinar on change management on January 17th. So look out for more information about that, and also look for more information about the um, Include Museum Leadership Symposium. More information, Rhiannon will be getting back to us. Thanks again, Rhiannon, and yeah. thank you so much, Pedal. All right, take care, everyone. Okay, bye. Bye.